My name is William Thaddeus Coleman, Jr. And I was born in Germantown, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, when when uh, were you born? When exactly? Uh, July the 7th, 1920, at uh, 12 minutes after midnight. My mother always said I came at inconvenient times. <laughs> Why does she say that? Well, because a lot of times I would show up for, for dinner and she didn't expect me and things like that. So, but her joke was, so I thought you were the one born 10 minutes after 12 midnight. So. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your family. Um, tell me your parents' names and a little bit of information about them. Well, my mother was a mason and she uh, lived in Baltimore. What was her name? Uh, Laura Beatrice Mason. And uh, she taught school for German for two years after she finished the normal school there, and she married my father. Uh, she, her father was actually in 1915, he was postmaster of Baltimore. And uh, when uh, Wilson got elected, he fired all postmasters, not because of color, but because it was, you know, political. And my, according to my mother, my grandmother went down with her five children and said, you can't fire my, my, my husband because in reliance on a good salary he's making, he's had five kids. He was the only guy who didn't get fired, so even though, and, uh, they, and then I, she had a, a grand uncle who was an Episcopal minister and they, the uncle operated the Underground Railroad out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and uh, on my father's side, my, my, my father was born in Baltimore too. And he, uh, uh, his father worked uh, uh, at the uh, biggest hotel there as, as the hit guy running the hotel. Uh, and uh, both those People died before I was born, uh, and uh, I also know my mother was born and born right next to Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall family lived in the next house. Did they know the Marshall family, or did you know the Marshall family growing up? Oh, oh well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew of him because uh, as he became more famous, my mother would say he was born right next door, and then I got to know him fairly early and admired him very much. So I had a lot of relationship with him. So in let's fact, that picture, when I got sworn in Secretary of Transportation, he was the one that swore me in. So. Well, um, back up a bit and tell me a little bit about this uh, great uncle who, or great great uncle, who operated the Underground Railroad. Yeah. What? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, his name was Mason, but he, uh, well, the, as I understand the background of the family, that uh, on the Mason side, my uh, mother's family lived in Sweden for many years and somehow got over to the French West Indies. And there, the, one of the women married a French nobleman. But when he wanted to take her back to France, the family said, you can't do that. <laughs> and so instead of that, he gave them a lot of money to come to the States. So they all lived fairly well, and one of them went to school and was trained as a minister. And uh, I, I never met him, but uh, uh, I guess he says that, you know, but they, sometimes it would be white women that would come up uh, to stay because they were pregnant. And if the child came out light enough, she'd go back home. If it didn't, uh, sometimes she'd give the child up or she and the uh, child and the guy that got up pregnant would get up to Canada, and that's, so that's what I remember about that part of the family. That's interesting. Now tell me how your parents met. Well, they both lived in Baltimore, and they met, but I tell you first, before that, uh, in the tenth year of high school, my father and several other boys would you know, walk from home to school, and they'd pass a Chinese laundry. And they got in the habit of saying Ching Ching Chinaman. One day the Chinese got uh, angry and picked up an iron and threw it back at my father. And my father picked up and threw it back at him, didn't hit him fortunately, but broke the window. 
At that point, according to Grandmother Coleman, every policeman in uh, Baltimore was looking for him. And she called one of the Murphys that she knew, you know, the Afro-American people knew the room, and said, I know you know the president of Hampton. You've got to tell him you got to take my son. So the president of Hampton said, certainly I'll take him, you know. So he gets down there. When he gets there, the first time they realized he was only in the 10th grade, so he couldn't go to college. But fortunately, Hampton had a trade school there. So from you know, 10th to 12th, he went to trade school, and then he went to Hampton, finished Hampton, taught for a year in some place in North Carolina, uh, and uh, then came to Philadelphia to set up the Whiskey Boys Club. The Quakers had staff, they had a camp, and then he used to also travel about two months a year setting up all other boys clubs. How did he get involved with setting up boys clubs? Well, when he resigned from the job in uh, uh, North Carolina, he found out that the Quakers, the John T. Emlyn family of the rich Quakers, was setting up a boys club for actually blacks and poor white kids. And so they set up a boys club at Cole Street, Plasky Avenue. And so he did that. And then about 10 years later, uh, Mr. Emlyn gave him money to buy the camp. So they bought the camp in Montgomery County, which is about 35 miles out of the side of Philadelphia, and by that time the Boys Clubs of America would form and wanted somebody to go to set up Boys Clubs, but he spent about two months a year doing that. And so when your parents married, um, are you the only child? No, I'm the second. My first first child, my sister Emma, who was born four years before me. Okay. And what kind of career did she pursue? Well, she uh, finished high school in in uh, Germantown, Philadelphia, and she really wanted to go to Temple University, but uh, which is Philo School. But she was going to take the home economics course, and in the junior year you had to live in a dormitory, and at that time they wouldn't let blacks live in the dormitory. So instead, she ended up going to Hampton, and she finished Hampton, and for a year thereafter. She uh, worked someplace in Virginia, uh, and uh, during that year, uh, uh, they uh, did not, you know, uh, admit blacks to vote. And she and her husband went around training people how to vote, and they got enough vote to vote the mayor out. And then after that, she started teaching school in Virginia. And then she and she married guy named Dooley who also went to Hampton. And then they came to Atlantic City and she was a high school teacher in Atlantic City until she retired and she retired. Let me go back just a minute and ask you, what prompted your mother to uh, become a German teacher? Did she ever say? Well, when she, well, you, it's getting awkward because the, the Bisons were awfully bright. If you look at that, the uh, directory of that high school, the normal school, well, obviously it was segregated, and her sister was uh, graduated in the first class, and she was a summa cum laude, and she went on. And the whole Mason family were all bred. I would say that two-thirds of that family went to school and taught uh, there. But she was just a very bright, she taught German, and she was a very, very bright person. I was just wondering what uh, interested her in teaching uh, uh, that particular foreign language as opposed to Well, gee, they, they, they always had a great interest in, you know, the rest of the world. And they certainly uh, soon learned that a lot of people in the rest of the world were happy to be black, and they were pretty bright and friendly. Like I knew about the, what's the, the, the Queen of Sheba long before I knew about the Queen of First of England. I knew about Pushkin and other people, and that's just something she wanted to do. And I would say that most of the Mason kids uh, taught the uh, school, particularly the women, and the men usually went to work in the post office. So tell me, when you were growing up, what kinds of ideas or philosophies did your parents impart on you? Well, they certainly imparted upon me that I was, you know, an American, I was as good as anybody else. Uh, I had another aunt that knew Dr. Du Bois real well, and he used to sometimes come to the house and 
and most of the you know famous people of color I got to know because my family knew them and, and Aunt Emma who lived in Boston uh, and she would often come down and you know, have people come to see her so I just knew you know I just was fortunate enough to know the people that even then were fairly successful. What, what was it that you remember about Dr. Du Bois? Well, I, of course, I was much younger then, and, and I just remember him a very bright man, and, and even then you had the debate between the guy at Tuskegee, who was the, uh, uh, the Ren Tuskegee, who said that you've got to train black people, whereas Du Bois said, you know, you have a talent to tenth and you train, and I remember those debates going on, mm -hmm. and he was very, very nice. Okay. Now I understand you also had an opportunity to meet Langston Hughes. Yeah. Do you remember much about him? At who? Langston Hughes. You said her. It's a him. No, I said him. Do yeah, you remember I think much said about him? Yeah, I was. I said I didn't know she. She. Well, no, they were all bright in that group. You know, you're asking me something that happened 80 years ago or right. more, and I don't remember. But I'm just very impressed. They're very bright and articulate, and I really, between the Marshalls and Hughes and Du Bois, I really got the different struggle as far, even in the black community, is how you move from where you were to where you really be part of the entire community, and uh, that's what I remember them as. Were your parents members of the NAACP? No, no, I don't think they were members of them, or, or the urban, they weren't members of I knew the guy who was head of Urban League, too. Uh, uh, but no, they weren't hit at all. But he had the boys' club and spent most of his time there. Uh -huh. And they were very good. They, you know, like uh, uh, who's a great singer? Uh, come on, who's Marion Anderson? No, the man. Oh, the man. Uh, uh, Paul Robeson? No. Well, well, come on, come on. You know, knowing well. Oh, come on. You're talking about a recent no, person? No, in, in the movie. Bill Cosby. Oh, Bill Cosby. Well, he was a club boy. And so I knew him, you know, when he was young. In fact, the first piece he did was about playing basketball in the Whiskey Boys Club. So I knew him and uh, Herb Adderley, and, you know, and there were a lot of kids that came that went on to medical school and other became athletes, uh, you know, Wilk Chamberlain, all those. So that's the type of uh, people I knew there. Did you have a favorite sport? Well, I was, I swam. My best sport was swimming. Uh, uh, I was a good football player as long as they had the single wing because I could remember the the plays. Uh, but once they went to the T formation, I was a lousy passer, so therefore I used to play a defensive halfback. But that was then, uh, you know, up through high school that I didn't. When I was at Penn, I, I ran the quarter and a half mile for a year until a guy named Johnny Woodruff of Pittsburgh came in and could beat me. Plus the fact the war started and I knew there would be no Olympics war stuff in Europe. So then I figured I better get the books so I started to get more attention to ah. Now I under, I've read that um, somewhere between the age of 10 and 12 you developed an interest in becoming a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you remember what prompted that interest. Well, first, uh, I think you know, when I became the first boy in the Coleman family, uh, you know, family, uh, my mother really thought someday I was going to be the fiscal minister because they'd been a fiscal minister family, but I told her that wasn't for me. Then, when I was about 14, uh, a wonderful doctor, Dr. Graves, who used to work at the camp, took me to, to Mercy Douglas Hospital to see an operation for cancer of the guts, and I figured that wasn't me. And then my mother and father uh, used to spend the first two weeks in December arguing about how much money they could spend for Christmas. And they finally would decide upon, oh, maybe they could spend, uh, you know, $800, which was a lot of money then. And so my sister and I would meet my mother downtown, but my sister would say, she's older, would say, well, why don't you shop for me first? Uh, because uh, I can then take the trolley back and you know start getting dinner. So when you get home, dinner will be ready. Well, that meant the first hour and a half they'd be in the lady. I didn't want to stay there, so I went outside of Warnermakers 
and it was cold December. So I then went over to the court and I saw these people arguing cases and everything. I said, you mean to tell me they pay you money for doing that? And so that's how I decided I was. And then later I found out about Thurgood Marshall and Bill Hastie and others and Charlie Houston, so that's where I So did you find out at that time that you enjoyed debate? Well, I thought that being a lawyer, I thought another thing was at Penn, because uh, I started at the college uh, at Penn in, 19, in February 1938. And fortunately, one day when my father was in town for a, a meeting, he sat next to a lawyer who said, gee, if, you're, if your son wants to be a lawyer, he better learn something about business. So I took probably half of my courses in the Wharton School. And I just, to me, it seemed to be what I wanted to do. Hmm. That's interesting. So did you have any classmates, um, uh, either in elementary, junior high, or high school, who also talked about going into law as a career? Frankly, no. The, my best classmate at, in high school, a guy named Bob Tressville, who uh, went on to West Point and became a fighter pilot, uh, he finally got killed uh, 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 in over Europe, a very good friend. And uh, when you know, when I went to Germantown High School, there couldn't have been more than four blacks in my class, and there was one young lady who went to school, and that was it. Uh, I uh, went out for the swimming team because that's something I really could do well, and they wouldn't let me on the swimming team, uh, and. Uh, when they told me that, uh, I was very disappointed, uh, and uh, and my mother and father came up and said, you know, you can't keep them off the team. And then they abolished the team, and one of my first irritations in life, the day I graduated in February, that they posted a sign starting up the team again. Uh, another guy, oh, somebody, I think Jacob for Swartz, who taught me, I think, political science or something in high school, gave me by far my best recommendation to go to Penn. Uh, and I, uh, and he would always tell me, and I'd come back later after I became a lawyer, you know, the real reason why I couldn't go in because we practiced at the YMCA, mentioned the C, it wasn't say the Christian thing, he was just saying the white Christian Y wouldn't take you, so that's the reason why. So I didn't do that. Now, I understand that when you initially tried to uh, join the swimming team that the uh, principal um, suspended you from school, is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. When my mother and father came up and said, you know, you can't do that to uh, Coleman, so at least I stayed in school and uh, I finished. Uh, what was the reason the principal gave for suspending you? Well, because I was raising it because I couldn't be on the swimming team. Oh, they also spent something else. Uh, uh, I had to write a paper and give a an address, and when I got finished, uh, the teacher said, you know, that was good, Bill or William, whatever she called me, uh, someday you'll make somebody a good chauffeur. And I said, you know, good bitch, someday you'll probably be driving me around, for which I got <laughs> kicked out of school, and my father and mother had to come up and you know, get me back in. So what did your parents say to you after you told them what you told the teacher? Well, they just said that among, I, I shouldn't use such words in school or among people that I'd learned living in Germantown near the boys club, but Plasky Town where the poor people were on the side. And you know, so that was something we've done. So I, I got, and I Miss Eggy, the teacher did it, became a very good friend of mine afterwards. So she's a good teacher. I mean, she taught me English, and I, she, she was very good. But, you know, it was a different time then, you know. Well, it sounds like um, your parents instilled in you uh, a sense that you should stand up for your yeah. rights. Well, you know, if you've had lunch, even though you're much younger, you have dinner or lunch, people like Du Bois and those people, you knew you were as bright as anybody else that came along because they were really able people. And uh, so I never you know, had a feeling that I was, you know, not as good as anybody else. Was it expected of you to go to college? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, my mother and father, they were an off time. I'm probably the only kid that lived in my block on Arm Terrace that never owned a bicycle. My parents said, yeah, I'm putting away the money for you to go to college. So I, oh, no, I would, would assume that we, of course, I thought my, most of my 
mother and father had gone to college. Most of my relatives had gone to college. And so, you know, and I went to Penn and, uh, in February, finished in three and a half years. Uh, I was summa cum laude from there. I won a Pi Gamma Mu key, but I didn't win the Phi Beta Kappa key. I found out 30 years later that uh, because Penn asked me to go on their board, and I said, gee, why should I do that? Uh, and the president looked up and found out that that I was voted in Phi Beta Kappa because a year before they had voted another black in, they felt they shouldn't have them too soon. Or that would show that Penn was reducing its standard. So they gave me one 30 years later, so I, I do have one. So, wow. yeah. so did you have, uh, or did you think about another school prior to the University of Pennsylvania? Well, no, I thought uh, Penn was, well, I, 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 paced, I thought somewhat about Princeton, only because Princeton beat the hell out of us in a football game at, at, Penn, at Penn. So uh, I, that, but no, with Penn, but, and you know, we're right in the city of Philadelphia because I lived home and uh, uh, commuted, you know. I finished in three and a half years. So. No, I thought Penn was a pretty good school. And then I applied for the Penn Law School and the Harvard Law School. Uh, Penn accepted me and gave me a full scholarship. Harvard accepted me, but no scholarship. But my mother and father thought it made more sense to go to uh, Harvard Law School than to Penn. And uh, fortunately, uh, my mother's sister lived in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and she made an arrangement I could live there. And uh, so I went there and registered in September, and then in February, I did so well in the first exam that they called me in and gave me a rector after scholarship to, to September. And by that time, my father had paid three quarters of it. So I just wrote and told him that uh, he didn't have to send me money for the fourth quarter. You know, I did not tell him that they also gave me a check for three hundred dollars, which was refund. Really because at that time I was trying to persuade a girl in Boston to pay some attention to me, and, and Eddie Brook was up at Fort Devens, a handsome second lieutenant. And I figured so, but then I redeemed it because nine years later I bought my father's last car for which I paid nine thousand dollars. So I always I, I made up to it, but I never told my mother and father that I didn't send him the money back. I was wondering, um, at any point in your in your career from, say, high school through college, did you ever waver in your desire to become a lawyer? Well, I'm pretty sure that at one time when I once again thought about medicine, uh, and at other time I certainly thought about some of the scientific things they were doing, uh, and once I went to the Wharton School for half my courses, I certainly felt about that, but basically I, well by then I knew Raymond Pace Alexander, and I, you know, some might say, and I just thought the legal pro profession was a good profession. Well tell me a little bit about your first year at Harvard Law. Well, it, it was great. Uh, the first year I lived in Dorchester, so I uh, could uh, uh, commute from Dorchester to, to Harvard Square, which was a 50 minute ride which you could read all those books of 50 minutes, which caused me to break one of the rules my mother had taught me, namely that whenever you got on a trolley car or a transit line, if a woman comes on, you should never let her stand. And you know, you should give her a seat. Well, after the first time I did that, I said, hell, I, did. I couldn't read a book standing up. So I changed the rule to say if she were real pretty or if she were real pregnant, I'd get up otherwise. <laughs> I'd sit there, so I got there. And then the first day I came to Harvard Square, after I was coming up, I bumped into a guy who was certainly my, my best friend, a guy named Elliot Lee Richardson, who went on to great fame. And uh, he took me over to the law school with him because he'd gone to college. And we became friends. I, you know, I just knew people then. The, they were there with, you see, as far as people of color, there was a guy named Wade McCree who went on to be Solicitor General, very good, and another guy named, I forget the second guy's name, I should remember him because I worked with him for a year, that he, he worked in New York and, as, a, as a lawyer, uh, and uh, there was a guy named George Layton who went on to be a federal district judge, so that, that was it. So 
these individuals that you met, um, uh, how was how were your classes? What kinds of uh, uh, situations did you have in in among? Not let me back up. What kind of relationship did you have with your professors? Well, most of them I got along with with all right. Yeah, they, you know, they were you know the Harvard then they would assign you cases to read, and then they have a discussion back and forth and. They call upon you, and you'd speak. Uh, fortunately, I, there was another guy named Harold Oscarwild who came from a very rich family in Michigan, and we became friends. I used to study with him a lot. Unfortunately, he got killed on D-Day at the beach in Normandy. Uh, but uh, you know, and, and we and we just had a good association. And then, in, uh, I'd done so well on the first exam that after that, people just see I was a nice guy. So you know, I got more friends. And, we just had a good time. Did you ever feel any pressure because you were a minority? Well, sure. Well, at times you did, sure. I, I uh, in retrospect, I always resented that at one time the, the, the federal government started giving me your money uh, if you work in school but do some job, and they had this group downstairs, all of us were black, or about seven holes to him. University. I just thought that didn't make sense, so I just felt that it was, you know, better to to get to know everybody. And some of my friends, well, Elliot Richardson came from a very wealthy family, he invited me to dinner and, and everything. So, I, you know, it was a pretty good thing. And then after the first year, when I made the Harvard Law Review, I moved then and had the free scholarship. I then moved and lived in the dormitory, and that was, you know, even better life. I thought. So, tell me what it was like to be on the Harvard Law Review. Well, then it was it was great. I mean, the only the first person of color like it was Charlie Houston, who's up there, and the second one was Bill Hastie, and I was the third. And what really meant that you, you know, took classes from nine to twelve, and then you would go over the Harvard Law Review and work until about eight o'clock at night, and then you'd go home and go you know take classes. Or, uh, but it, it was very exciting, and then there were only, let's see, uh, uh, only about 30 people on it. So you really, at least, was thought through the rest of the school as being something special. And so, yeah. and I got to know a lot of good friends. So, you know. Do you feel that your position on the the uh, law review um, elevated your your credibility uh, even among professors? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sure. Well, you know, once you've made it, and you know, there's sometimes it'd be dinners where professors and lawyer review people, because many professors made lawyer review. And it really was a different type of life that you had than if you went to school. School. And we're the same. I say now there's many more. Then you made it strictly on your grades, and and it was only the top 20 they would take. And sometimes it meant they would not take everybody that had an A average. So you know, it was really competitive and you got to know the the people at the year ahead of you who went on to great things. So no, I, I thought it was a great experience. Was there anything about that experience that expanded your perspective of the world or of careers or of government service? Well it did, except that uh, when I uh, finished law school and I'd go try to get a job, and none of them would hire me. And that certainly, you know. Uh, and fortunately, uh, at the 60th anniversary of the Harvard Law Review, I was uh, sitting next to Elliot Richardson, who was also in my class. And he said, what are you going to do next year, Bill? I said, I don't know. Nobody's given me a job yet. And he said, oh, that, that just can't be true. I said, yeah. So the next morning, at about Nine o'clock, a chauffeur shows up in my uh, uh, apartment and uh, says that uh, I've been instructed by Mr. Richardson's uncle, a name Henry Shattuck, to give you these nine books, but also bring you down to his his uh, office to meet him. So I went down there. About twenty minutes, he called up a guy named Charles Curtis, who was partner in one of the big law firms, was also a leading Democrat in the Senate and said, I found somebody you really should take in your firm. And uh, 
uh, at the end of it, she said, the fact that you have to be colored, I'm pretty sure that should make any difference to you, because you've been making all these speeches, how you got to, you know, take He said, oh, we can't do that in Boston, they'd never stand for it. But fortunately, I have a friend in New York who probably would, which was Lord K. Garrison, who's the grandson of the Lord K. Garrison that you know, and a guy named Louis Weiss, Paul Weiss was from Garrison, and they, I interviewed them and they offered me a job. But in the meantime, uh, Judge Goodrich, who was on the Third Circuit, the United States Court of Appeal, offered me a job being his law clerk, uh, but said I couldn't come until May, because the other law clerk didn't leave until then. And the school then gave me a teaching fellowship for that eight months. Uh, and so I then uh, uh, ended up clerking for him for a year. And one day I got a call from Henry Hart and said, would you like next year to be Felix Frankfurter's law clerk? And I said, yes, and he hung the phone up. And about a month and a half later, I, I didn't know I had a, didn't know whether I had a job or not. I just know if I did, it started the first of September. So I called Paul Florent, who was one of my best teachers, and told him the story. He said, I'll check. So he called Henry Hart. And Henry Hart tells Paul Florent, said, gee, that comb is not as bright as you said he was because he ought to realize if I asked him, he said, yes, he had the job. So I, that's how I got the job. So I worked for Frankfurt and then after that, having, you know, led my class at Harvard Law School, having clerked for a judge on the Third Circuit, having won the Bill Prize, the best for uh, conflict of law, and having clerked a year for Felix Frankfurt, no Philadelphia firm, no Boston firm, no uh, Boston firm would give me a job. So I then remember that Paul Weiss had offered me a job, so I called them, and I, so I ended up at Paul Weiss, working for about two and a half years. Uh, with, uh, uh, I still lived in Philadelphia because when I was working for Griffin, I bought a house. If by that time I was married, I bought a house in Philadelphia. So I used to commute every day, which meant I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning, get there by nine o'clock, and then you could commute to New York. My first class would only cost you thirty-five dollars a month, so I would, uh, you know get a ticket right first class and I would see a lot of Philadelphians because they were going over to New York to work and you know being a person of color they, they soon recognized me and I picked up two or three clients that way and I stayed at Paul Weiss uh, and during that time Thurgood Marshall also asked me to help him in the Brown so, uh, and I stayed until I went to Philadelphia. Yeah, let me back up a minute and, and go back to um, your time at Harvard. Um, about in 1942, you decided you wanted to enter into the military. Well, I, I, my draft number came up, uh -huh. and I knew at that time that there was the Tuskegee Airmen, but they were only taking in 30 a year, so I figured if I volunteered for that, that held would be five years before they get around when I finished law school. But it so happened that after I volunteered, of Bill Hasty, who was the uh, a civilian aide to the Secretary of Defense, resigned because they segregated the airmen, and the government at that point called us all up. <laughs> so I, so that's why I ended up at, and I went from uh, from Harvard down to Luxie, Mississippi, and you know, that uh, I knew, because by that time there had been some lawsuits, that they had to give me a first class ticket and they couldn't seg segregate me. And so I called the recruiting authority and said, look, uh, I know I've gone down to Biloxi and I know that below the May 6th line they segregate, but I'm telling you, when I get segregated, I'm going to call you and say, you got one little soldier here, I'm not going any further. And he said, oh, I'll send you first class. So I went first class from Boston. My father came up to pick up my clothes and everything. Washed it down to Blux, Mississippi. Got there at 7.43 in the morning, and this white sergeant came up to me and said, hey, nigga, where are you going? I kept walking. Then, I still feel sorry for that, but then he said, hey, boy. So I figured I'd settle for that, and I told him. So he said, well, I'm supposed to take you to Blux Air Base, and so that's how I entered the U.S. Army. How did that, 
how did going into Mississippi of all places make you feel? Well, I guess you know, uh, you know, particularly well, actually before that, with the whole when I got called, you know, called up or the draft before I decided to volunteer, I went to see Charlie Houston, and I said, you know, I learned enough about human rights, constitutional law. How in the hell? Can I go into a segregated unit? And Charlie said, "You know, life is changing, and you got to do it." Because he had told he went in first world war in a segregated unit, and he was the one that advised me to do it. If I hadn't uh, gotten his advice, I'd probably end up in jail rather than doing it. But, but it, it, you know, worked out. Good. Well, let me follow up with um, uh, Charles Houston. When did you first have an opportunity to meet him? Well, I'm pretty sure I first met him at the Harvard Law School. He just came back for. A, a law review banquet, and the same way Bill Hasty, both of them, and I knew of them, and that's how I met them. Uh, but, uh, but so after being at Mississippi for about two weeks, they then took took me to Tuskegee, and I started training to be a fighter pilot. But I washed out in basic training, and then. Uh, about a month later, they sent me to the Harvard Business School to become a statistical control officer. So I did that, then they assigned me to Gardner Field where the black pilots were being trained in Freeman Field, Indiana. Uh, Tell me a little bit about the people that you met while you were there, if, if you remember any oh, of the Oh, they, they, they were good. Uh, gee, one guy, gee, very good, he's a professor at NYU. Uh, who really was a hell of a pilot, and uh, oh, and he, actually, he was the first fighter pilot that learned how to beat a German jet under, you know, jet, which was simple. He let the guy get on his tail, then he slow up, and then plane would shoot fast, and he'd shoot it down. And for the first year and a half, that was the recommended way to do it. And then another guy, old named Bob Tressville, who had gone to high school with me, but he's the one who went to Westport. He then, you know, military was, uh, actually, you know, Carl Roy, boy, his wife, her first husband, Bob Tressville, a very, very, very able guy, but he got killed during the war. And, uh, but he would, uh, was, he was a hell of a pilot, very good pilot, and uh, the rest of them, a lot of them were very, very good. So your experience uh, there was pretty positive, at least in terms of the people that you met. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, these were these were these were these were fine people. But you know, and most of them didn't like being segregated. But other than that, it it, it was it was good. Uh, now, was this your first time below the Mason-Dixon line, with the exception of maybe visiting relatives in Baltimore? Other than the fact that I'm, my father took me to Hampton a couple of times, but other than that, I. But we drove to half, so I didn't. I didn't mean to track. We segregated. Was there a difference between going to Virginia and going to Mississippi? Going to where? Virginia and going to Mississippi. Oh well, but well, Mississippi was probably worse, but Virginia was bad enough then. Uh, and I, you know, and, uh, I, that, that's that's the way it did. But I, I never, of course, you know, when I was law clerk to. Mr. Justice Frankfurter here, uh, the, the, the restaurants were segregated. And in fact, uh, I remember one day, and we used, didn't bother us because we, we, we used to eat in the court lunchroom, but uh, uh, there was a day when the court was working, but everybody else was closed. And uh, I remember. Uh, being in working with Justice Frankfurt on opinion, Elder Richardson, who was the other clerk, came along and said, Bill, we all decided to go down to Mayflower for uh, lunch. I said, wait 20 minutes, I'll go with you. So when I went out, Elliot said, well, gee, it's so late, let's go down to the railroad station. I went and I come back, and I noticed about an hour after Frankfurt and Elliot were there, they were both crying. And it turned out that apparently Elliot had uh, Decide I better check to see whether they'll take COVID. They bow out and say, no, we don't take black. And that's what it did. I say this only because recently I read that in a case four years later, when they were discussing 
that Douglas said that Frankfurt has spent a lot of time talking about this, and one reason why the case that now said you can eat in here came about. I, mean, I didn't know that, but I read that in an article about a week ago. Hmm. Well, while you were uh, down in Mississippi uh, and uh, training, uh, you indicated in one of your uh, bios that um, that you did not complete the advanced training to become an airman. Well, I I, I, I got I, I, I got through honestly pre-flying. I got through primary. I got through basic, but the last day as to whether I was going to go to advanced training, the guy said, you know, you'd make a good bomber pilot, but I don't want you up here as a fighter pilot. So I got plucked out. But three weeks later, I guess in part because I knew Hugh Scott real well, who was a Republican senator from uh, uh, Pennsylvania, I got sent to the Army Air Corps in Texas. Uh, and I was about the only black in the class. Uh, and then uh, a month later, I got sent to Harvard Business School. It was great because then I could see my, my girlfriend again because she was still at Boston University. Uh, and uh, when I, you know, so that, that would, would, would work. No, I would, I wish, you know, I, I'm pretty sure if they'd had bombers as well as fight, I probably would have been a fighter pilot, but I did. But I did this, this control work. But then uh, after the war was over in Europe, they brought all the black pilots back to Freemanfield, Indiana, and to train them to get ready to go to Japan. Uh, and they went into Freeman Field, which was basically a white field, uh, and then they wouldn't let them in the White Officers Club. And so they told me that they were going in the next day, uh, and uh, uh, don't you go in because you're the only person that knows any law, but I want you to call Thurgood Marshall. And, uh, and so they went in and they all got arrested. Uh, and. Uh, uh, to be caught my brother, they tried for him for violating the orders of the colonel. Uh, and uh, I and Ted Burry, who was a person in Cincinnati, he, Togo West's uh, father in law, uh, tried the case and we got him acquitted. Uh, and a uh, funny story about that was that they said, hey, What legal theory are you going to get him week? And I spelled out a certain thing, and my final thing was, well, I just don't think Roosevelt let you stay in jail. You know, you still pay. So what happens that morning is that uh, the ready rodeo die, <laughs> and Truman, you know, comes on, and uh, I go to see all my clients who are now in in confinement, and their first thing said, Jesus Christ, call me. You can't even depend upon a guy, white guy, dying at the right time. So we went in, and, and after we got that victory, which was all over the papers and everything, uh, about three weeks later, I get a letter from the commanding general of the army saying I'm the worst officer in the Corps, uh, and that he thought that they should uh, kick me out of the army, give up my profession, I mean, give up my commission. Uh, and. Uh, I said, well, one, you can't do this because there's an army regulation which says if you get a superior rating that unless they're going to give you another superior, they can't rate you for the next 30 days. And 28 days ago, I got a superior rating. And then I spelled out what I've done and everything. And I said, if you're still confused, why don't you read Army Court Martial so and so So I never heard any more about it. And I've been confirmed four times by the Senate, so I assume that and I'm a major general now, so I figured that's that on my. I feel embarrassed talking this way, but you're pretty good. But, but it's been fun life. Oh. Um, during this time, uh, you met your future wife. Yeah, well, I met my future wife when I was at Harvard in 1941. How did you meet her? Well, you know, they they, they used to have uh, parties. Quite, you know, a few blacks at all the school, and somebody had a party. I met her one time, and uh, I'd start taking her out sooner. Tell us a little bit about her, first starting with her name and where she's from. Well, she was, she's from New Orleans. Her father was a 
doctor there, and also had to be a Republican. Uh, and it was very prominent. In fact, they named a school and a playground after him. I haven't checked to see whether they washed away during the flood yet. And he was a very able person. And I, what I mean, was his name? Uh, Dr. Joseph E. Harden. And, uh, and her mother was nice, nice lady. And uh, I got along to her well. Uh, and tell us your wife's name. What? Tell us your wife's name. Oh, Levita May Harden. L O V I D A M A E Harden. Yeah. Okay. And that's a picture right back there. Yeah. And she went to Boston University? She went to Boston University. Well, actually, she went to school in New Orleans, but then they said maybe you won't get in a good college. So she, for the last two years, she went to Boston Latin School in Boston because she had an uncle that lived in, in Massachusetts. And then she went to BU uh, and she finished BU. And uh, just to add to the story, uh, about Two months ago, my son, the youngest one, Hardy, it just was made dean of the School of Education at BU, and I also sent a hundred thousand dollars to them to scholarship in the name of my wife. So he's a, That's he, wonderful. He's the first two kids are lawyers, but he's the only one not the lawyer. He said he wanted to teach. He taught after he finished uh, Williams. He taught at prep schools in Philadelphia. Then he, I mean, yeah, in Philadelphia, around Philadelphia. And then he went and married a wonderful girl, and they went out to China and taught at the University of Shanghai for two years. Called me one day and said, I just got accepted to Stanford to get a PhD in psychology. I'll assume you'll pay for it, which we did. And the day he graduated, Donna Shalala, who used to be secretary, and at that time she was president of Wisconsin, she offered him an uh, assistant professor there, so he was at Wisconsin about 18 years, and he just finished it. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what what uh, kind of career was your wife looking to? Uh, well, have? she taught. Well, she actually thought she was going to end up teaching high school, but in uh, in uh, when she went back to uh, New Orleans, uh, still she wasn't married to me yet. Uh, she, the only job she could get was teaching first and second grade, which she taught until we got married. Then she quit. And so what year did you get married? Oh, I got married in 1944. i tell you I got married, let's see. February 10th, yeah. And, um, and how long before you all began having children? Well, I got married. I stayed in the Air Corps for about a year. I was about two years after we got married, the first child. The first child was born when I was still at Harvard, uh, finishing, finishing law school. And your first child's name is? William Thaddeus Coleman III. He's, yeah. And my daughter's name, was the second child, was born four years later. Her name is Levita Harden Coleman, Jr. Uh, she got that name only because there were a lot of aunts named Matilda and everything. Wanted to be named after her. I said, I'm going to name it after my wife so nobody could jump on me. So I, so. And then your third son, excuse me, your second son, the third child. The second son, uh, his name is Harden L. Coleman. He won't, the L really was supposed to stand for learned because. I knew Learned Hand, who was a great judge on the second thing, but he won't take the Learned, so it's L. Uh, but then when he got married, the day before he got married, he changed his name to also put his wife's family name, Kennedy, so he married her. So it's got four names on it. Okay. Now, after you finished um, uh, Harvard and you were clerking with um, Justice. Uh, Frankfurter. Well, I first clerk with Judge Herbert F. Right. Goodrich. Right, and then the with Frankfurter. Um, I was wondering, tell me a little bit about those two men. Um, uh, well, both of them were very good. I mean, Judge Goodrich uh, was a very able, he had been uh, dean of the school of education, of school, law school at Penn, uh, and he was thought to be one of the three outstanding scholars in the whole field of conflict of laws. Uh, and he was awfully good, and you know, we'd go in and 
and uh, uh, listen to the cases and then he sometimes would say, why don't you do me a draft of the opinion, or he'd do a draft, but leave out all the, uh, 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 basically you're supposed to cite cases, expect you to get the cases, although I remember one time when I spent a week trying to find a case to support his proposition, and, and uh, I finally said, I can't find it. He said, I'll take care of that bill. He says, uh, this principle is so clear, I don't have to cite a case. So, so that's what we did. So he, he was very nice and really wanted to talk. But at the same time, he was also the executive director of the American Law Institute. Uh, and as a result of that, I got to meet a lot of the leading lawyers because they'd come to visit him, and, you know, great lawyers around. So I, I had a good year there. And at that time, you only had one law clerk. Now I think there are about three. Uh, then I clerked for Frankfurt in the fall. What did you learn from uh, Justice Goodrich uh, when it comes to writing briefs? Well, you, you learn, you know, what to do, what the points to make, and and you learn, or I learned, I thought I learned, that judges have great egos, and therefore they usually don't like to say they decided a case based upon what you exactly said, so you make those suggestions in a footnote or something, you pick them up and go like that. And it was very, I, you know, I learned how to argue cases in court of appeals, and, and I got to know the other judges who were very nice people, and actually... One judge I got to know is uh, oh, a judge from Delaware who actually was the first judge ever to declare school segregation unconstitutional. And so I you know, got to know him fairly well, and Biggs was a very good person. So I had a good time doing that year. And what did you learn from Justice Frankfurter? Oh, I learned everything from him. No, really, he was a very able, the first thing, by six o'clock in the morning, <coughs> he, had, he had read at least six newspapers. About 7.30 in the morning, he would walk to, to Atchison's house, and the two of them would walk in to work from Georgetown. And they'd all discuss the problems that would go on internationally. So he comes in, at that time the court didn't starts sitting until 12 o'clock, now it starts at 10 o'clock. And so the first hour and a half, you'd hear all what was going on in the world, what I said, what he said. And then Frankfurt had a lot of friends, you know, would come in, like Harold Laskin, or, and so you get that. But, but you then had to, you know, learn how the cases, very, very difficult cases, and uh, Frankfurt certainly was one of the leading justices there, and, he, and so we off to write papers. And, and I also, the next office, Justice Black had, and I remember one day walking uh, down the hall and Justice Black asked me to come to see him. He spent about a half hour arguing about a case trying to convince me that he was right and Frankfurt was wrong because he wanted me to go back and tell Frankfurt he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And finally I said, he said something, I said, Gee, you know, Mr. Justice, if you would repeat quietly what you said the last three minutes or so, you'll convince yourself that you're wrong and Frankfurt is right. At which point he put me out and uh, he told Frankfurt, he said, Coleman is a very relaxed guy, but he turned out to be a nice friend. <laughs> no, but really, that's a great experience. I mean, I, I, uh, you got to read my book, The Last Man to Think. And plus the fact, uh, uh, Elliot Richardson, who wasn't married then, lived in something called the House of Truth, which was established Actually, Frankfurt established it when he was working down here many years ago. And so there were a lot of bachelor lawyers that lived there. And on Sunday, they'd have a party from about 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock, because this was before the time of the football game. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'd see other justices there, you'd see uh, senators there, other people, and it really got, got, got to know you'd be discussing the issues. And, never repeated afterwards, and it was, it was a great year. I, I really enjoyed that year. This is the way he <laughs> autographed. Dear Bill, yeah. here is the end product of our happy collaboration during the 1948 term. Everything isn't... Everything in it that's wrong is that's one exclusively. <laughs> that's wonderful, yeah. Felix Frankfurt. Yeah. That is beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I understand. That's what we worked on. That's what that's what uh, I worked for you. Yes, I understand that um, uh, he recommended his wife uh, to help you with oh, yeah. some writing. Yeah. Explain that a little. Well, bit. because you know, uh, after I'd gone to public schools, over Elliot Richard had gone to private school, and Frankfurt had just said, you know, you don't write quite as well as you should, and he made a deal where. Uh, uh, I'd go to his house about 6.30 in the morning and his wife would, you know, rewrite some of the things, tell me how to write. But after a week she called Felix or sent him a note said, Felix, he writes better than you do. <laughs> and so that's how I stopped having to write. Uh, but, but, uh, but, you know, it makes a difference. I mean, you know, like my kids all went to private school and, you know, Barack Obama's kid is going to a good private school. And, and you're different now. You know, when I in Philadelphia, unless you went to Central High School or Girls High School, you knew the teachers weren't as good as they should be. And so I did that again. So you've done a lot of work, gee. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it sounds as if um, you had a very close collaborative relationship with the people who had been mentoring you up till this point. Oh, yeah, point. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, you spent three years in the New York law firm, yeah. and then you got a position in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So tell me a little bit about the kinds of cases that you had both in New York and then when you moved to well, back to I, Philly. Well, one, New York represented the playwright groups and, and uh, some of the great producers were there, and so I used to write the the, you know, contracts for them, or they had legal issues, did that. I also, something called the Talon Zipper Company, got sued, and, and I represented Talon, we, we took care of that. Then a big case I had was uh, Lloyd Garrison had been uh, made the master in a case involving where all the southern states had sued the Pennsylvania Railroad, claiming that the Pennsylvania Railroad discriminated against the southern states and charged them more than they did the northern states. And I, I wrote, I wrote the, the opinion for him to file with the court. Uh, and then we had uh, a TV case. I remember TV was just being developed, and uh, uh, Judge uh, Rifkin asked me to help him with that, and I helped him with that. And then we had various business deals. We used to a lot of business deals. And then, at that time, I would say that Paul Weiss probably had the best tax firm in the country, and Paul, Randolph Paul used to, and I used to do some of his tax work. I remember one involved the deductibility of fines you paid during the uh, regulation of prices as to whether that was deductible or not. And so I had a good time. I really, and then I helped him to argue a couple of cases in the Second Circuit, and I stayed pretty busy. Did you have a particular uh, favorite type of case that you dealt with, or well, a specialty? Well, the best advice I ever got from anybody was the day that I left Felix Frankfurt, and he had me and Elliot in a room, and he finally said, what you've got to realize that a good lawyer is the person who knows how to quickly become expert in what's relevant. So I've never, you know, I've argued 19 cases in the Supreme Court of the United States, only four which had anything to do with race. The banking cases, other cases. Uh, I've argued cases, you know, trademark cases. I spent uh, four years proving that uh, TV Guide was a distinctive name. We then sold it for billions of dollars. Uh, and I just feel that I have always done that. And of course, that doesn't mean that now I don't get some younger people to help me, but uh, I, I represent Merck, it, you know, the, 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 the uh, cases. I represent, uh, we, now we uh, do uh, all of Goldman Sachs representation in China. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not in China, but I, we, I got the client because I met uh, Steve, Steve Friedman when he was hit in, in Portugal of all places. And on a pulse, we, I represented both of them when they got confirmed to be uh, in, in the financial part of the government. And, you know, I've just done a lot of different things. I've tried cases. Uh, 
uh, and I would, you know, uh, negotiate. I remember once I represented Pat Am when they were selling their Pacific Division to to United, and it turned out that the deal had to be the 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 assets rather than the stock. At about two o'clock in the morning, I came in, and all the people sitting around the table working. And I said, "Where are you going to transfer the planes?" And they said, "Well, some will be in in Japan, some will be in New York, and we're just..." Sitting. I said, "You guys are crazy as hell! Why don't you transfer them when you're over the Pacific? Because then you don't have to pay the sales tax, and we may save more money on the sales, not paying the sales tax, than they paid us in legal fees." And I just, and I so happened being former Secretary of Transportation, I could keep the FAA open all night. So I said, so a pilot would get in a plane, two pilots in, in Japan, they get halfway across, not over any place, nation, call and say we're shifting the plane. The people in Oklahoma, the FAA would do it, and that's it. And we kind of, no, I mean, seriously, I mean, you, you have, I mean, some people have that attack. And the great tragedy is that you got these big deals. And you tend to pull out the last file, and you copy most of it. But this deal may be different, or you got to know how to do the different part. And that's what we try to do. So, do you think that um, your experiences uh, with with all these different judges yeah. and yeah. your experiences, uh, uh, perhaps uh, in Harvard, or at least in in talking with a number of people, help to? Give oh, you sure. this perspective? Oh yeah, yeah, and you get a, you get a good you get a better judgment during that. And when I was secretary, I I felt that uh, I you know had problems which I could solve some of them I made mistakes in. I mean, I, I always regret the fact that when I set up uh, Amtrak that I let them do it with the speed trains at the speed they are. I remember about two two months before I left the office, a German came to see me and started talking about levitation. I didn't know what the hell he meant. Uh, but levitation is that you know there's up trains go 250 miles an hour, and I think I would do better that. I tried very hard when the Penn Central was bankrupt to change the deal, which was then to sell it to Conrail and have Conrail operate it, which the government lost about 40 million dollars. What I wanted to do was sell half of it to the to the to the chassis, the other half to the uh, Southern Railroad, and that's what ultimately was done. I mean, Liz Dole did that ten years later, and that made more sense. So we we were we were and I you know when I was secretary, uh, there were about fifty percent of the interstate highways that weren't built yet because of environmental problems, and I think I. Resolve most of them, and most of them get built now. They talk about the soul; they got to be repaired. So, I, no, really, I, I really think that. Uh, and you watch, you know, most the, the good justices on the Supreme Court can move from subject to subject, and the good lawyers can. Although more people get a specialty, and they don't know what it is. So mm -hmm. I, I got a client, uh, you know, my, probably the most successful, most hit fund operator in the country. You know, and I, I do his work. Uh, and, and we and, and when Ford Motor Company got sued uh, soon after I came over here, uh, saying there were 20 million cars that would jump out of park, and the guy wanted to bring a class action suit, and I won the first cast saying that we couldn't have that by class action, and then we got Merck and you know that that problem, and, and uh, I got to represent Goldman Sachs really because. Uh, I was on the uh, uh, market. No, I was on the uh, okay, what do you call it? Trilateral Commission, and we were meeting in in Portugal. And after the meeting, we all decided to go to dinner at this wonderful restaurant. And different cabs. I was in the last cab with Steve Freeman, who at that time was head of head of, uh, of Goldman Sachs. Uh, and we couldn't speak any Portuguese, the guy couldn't speak English, so after an hour and a half he kicked us out. We then had to walk, about an hour later we found a place, so we get back to the United States by Thursday, uh, Steve Freeman says, well, Bill, I think Goldman, Goldman Sachs should start using you as one of their lawyers, what's your specialty? 
And I said, Steve, I got lost with you for three hours. You know, I could fake anything. <laughs> so instead of that, why don't you let me bring five of my bright young people over and, you know, and they'll, you know, don't, they won't know your name on Monday, but they don't, and that's what we do now. And we represent them exclusively in China, exclusively Japan, and we do a lot of work for them here. You know. And Hank Paulson, who's just secretary, I represented him, and uh, uh, that's, you know, and uh, no, I'm serious. I, I, I shouldn't talk this way because I feel like bragging, but, you know, I'd like to pass it on to the next generation. That's exactly what we want. Um, uh, kind of going back to, um, uh, this period before you became Secretary of Transportation, I want to talk a little bit about the many different offers that you had to serve in uh, public office, yeah. uh, starting with Eisenhower. Can you tell me a little bit about... Well, I did. I, well, at Eisenhower, I was on uh, the Brass Ricky Commission, and that was the first commission set up by Eisenhower to get blacks employed in the government other than where they were. And Branch Rickey was the president of it. We'd come down and we'd work it out and we'd finally get a, somebody, you know, one guy put there at that place and they were very interested in, and you see Eisenhower a lot. And he was very concerned. I mean, there's a wonderful book you ought to read. Uh, it's called Eisenhower and the Civil Rights Movement. And he did more than people realized to get it, you know. And uh, we, we did that. Uh, and. Uh, we uh, had the whole question of the Concord landing and uh, had to work through that. Uh, and uh, as I say, when I started, there was at least 50 percent of the uh, highways weren't being built because of the environmental fights, and I cleaned all those up. Uh, and then we had the automobile thing as to make them put seat belts on and things like that. And, uh, if we'd won the election, I was going to be the Attorney General, but Floyd told me that Levy wasn't going to stay, so but we lost the election by one state, so I went back right before. So tell me when you first met, um, not quite then, but President Eisenhower. Well, I first, in 1952, in, I think it was in Illinois where the convention was, because Levita's father was on the Louisiana delegation, and he and John Minor Wisdom, who became a great judge in the Fifth Circuit, were the two that led the delegation from Taft to Eisenhower. He knew that, and then I used to see him. And then there's a picture up there of uh, it was a trial. It was the uh, Brass Ricky Commission. You know, you see them, and I and several other things I do, do them. Now, at the the same time, actually, a few years prior to that, you started working with. Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal. Why well, I, I did that was all volunteer. I still right. worked practice law full time, but I worked with him and, and uh, brought in another guy named Lou Pollock, who was the dean of Yale Law School, and he'd clerk for Rutledge when I'd clerk for uh, Frankfurt, and he married a girl whose name was Weiss, who's the daughter of the lawyer Weiss and Paul Weiss, so we became the best of friends, and still are, and uh, he worked. Uh, have you read that book? On the school segregation case, you find out that we, they think we've made a great contribution. Mm -hmm. What uh, prompted you to um, uh, donate your time with the um, Well, I just thought it was team. important. Well, come on. You know, <laughs> you know, there but for the grace of God. Go out. No, I just thought it was important. that something you had to do, and that's what you should do. But the only difference, I, I soon realized I didn't want to spend all my time doing things because of the color of my skin. I, you know, wanted to do things for reason, you know, because they should be doing them. And I thought that's what, what could be done. I think I've made a lot of contribution, and I think it helped. But I, I remember uh, when I was the I-66 to be built, and the governor there with me, and we worked out, and one thing I said, well, you've got to put the transfer line through there for free. Uh, and then I said, you got to uh, agree you're going to hire more black employees. And he, he uh, said, well, uh, you're trying to blackmail me. I said, do you think you should use that word? <laughs> uh, and I said, oh, I want you to. And so he did it. And, and we, you know, we had no, and then he said, good idea. And he did it in other places. 
I became best friend. He, at least he bought me into me one day in New York at the 21 Club, and he picked up the tabs, and he became. He was governor of Virginia. And no, really, it's a, it's a, that. But a lot of you know, they, they're probably about five percent of people you know that operate that way. And I think they're better off that if we all had pitched in the NWCP and done nothing but that. Mm -hmm. Um, did you work on any one particular case that was part of the class action suit with the Brown? Oh, well, I worked on all five of the cases because it was a, there was, on the re-argument, mm -hmm. there was a single brief. Mm -hmm. And I worked on all five of the cases. Uh, and then I worked probably as much, if not more, in the Little Rock case. Uh, and that case was, uh, we had to get a stay out of the justice who controlled that circuit, who was Justice Whitaker, and we went to the Supreme Court, and nobody knew where he was. So we had finally, about th five o'clock, the circuit said, "Call me. You're still dumb. Don't you realize that every justice has a black valet? So why don't you get on the telephone and start calling all the ministers and find out uh, who?" his valet is, and that's how you know where the justice is. So it's only about three hours later we did that, we got it done, and the, and, and the, uh, the, 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 the valet said, oh, I put Justice Whitaker on a train at 9 o'clock in the morning for California, because he's going out to the ABA convention. So we hired an airplane and flew it to Nebraska, <laughs> and we saw the train, show the reporter his, his uh, picture and so say he's in car number, you know, he's in cab number so-and-so. When, when it gave a certain he signed the papers. That's the only way we got that case for call back. No, really, I always would think, you know, you, 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 you did. And, uh, that was and, rather dramatic. And then, you know, I got a picture with Martin Luther King over there. And, you know, he was in the, in the Alabama, Birmingham, he was arrested. Uh, and a friend of mine, uh, who was working in the Solicitor General's office, who had been a Frankfurt law clerk before, called me and said, do you know, we read the statute, and the uh, statute doesn't call for a prison sentence, so therefore you can't hold the guy in jail to the hearing. Uh, I've been trying to locate Nixon to tell him, because Nixon's run against Kennedy. So he could get credit for it, but I can't find him. But I figured if I tell you, you'll let the legal defense fund him. So we let the legal defense know, and that's how the guy got out of jail, or the Kennedy got the credit for it. But, uh, you know, so those, you know, and, I, and the knowing kind of fact that I knew Phil Neal, you know, did it. And, and uh, uh, later I did something for him. And then when Leon Higginbotham became uh, uh, the, on the Federal Trade Commission, the other people didn't like him. And, and, and Phil Neal, Phil Teller was the one that really liked him and really made his life much easier that he became a judge on the Third Circuit. Why didn't the, some of the people like him? What? Why didn't some of the people like him? I don't know. Well, they were all white. And, you know, those white boys, they were all day adored. The thing he was the first minority put on the Federal Trade Commission. And he's brighter than that. He was a very bright, very able guy. Mm -hmm. So when you... Um, uh, uh, I would say by the, the 1960s, you were offered uh, opportunities to work in the Johnson administration well, yeah. and uh, also um, um, a little bit later on in uh, Well, Nixon's I worked Johnson. I was, I was the general counsel to the Warren Commission in Johnson administration. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I, well, I got to know Johnson because Frankfurt was sick and Walter Reed and Johnson was in the next room. And when I come to see Frankfurt, Johnson would come in, freshman senator from Texas, talk to me, and he got to know me. And then when uh, they created the Warren Commission, I had known Earl Warren, you know, and I also knew President Ford. And so they asked me would I be general counsel, I mean, be one of the senior counsel. I said, well, I became that for, for a year. I still practice law full time, but I used to come down here and work several days a week. And, uh, my charge was was whether the Cubans and or the Mech or the Soviets had anything to do with the assassination. So I spent a lot of time on that. 
Uh, and, I, and I wrote the first, the first sentence in the report I wrote called the Human Crippler is that the, the sentence says that the hardest thing to prove is a negative. <laughs> you know, you prove a positive, you got to say, if somebody was there, you, yes, I saw her. But a negative is kind of hard. So That's very true. Did, um, what were your impressions of Johnson when you first? Oh, he was good. I mean, he he was he was he was a very. I liked Johnson. I, I, I liked him, uh, and I liked his I liked his wife, and uh, uh, we we got along quite well. Uh, in fact, the picture. But anyway, he's got a press release in his hand. We trying to point me to the Third Circuit. I'm telling him why I can't do it. So, uh, but he was always but the whole family was very, and Chuck Robb helped me on something, although. You know, I, we got along quite well. So, what was your reason for not wanting to be appointed to the Third Circuit? I had three children, all in college. Have you, you know, you had, had let's see, one at Williams, one at, uh, and two at the Yale Law School. So I couldn't afford it. And your son, when he was at uh, Yale Law School, had a roommate. Uh, named Bill Clinton. Oh yeah, probably? yeah, Bill Clinton. That's why I got the presidential freedom because he could Bill Clinton. He said I got it for other things, Bob. But no, I knew Bill. I fed him for a whole year. The first year, he was poor as a church mouse. But he's very bright because Billy said that he would travel a lot, campaign. But the last two months, he comes and Bill let me see your notes, and he ended up getting a better mark than Bill got. So he was, you know, he's very bright. And I, I remember Hillary. I've met Hillary several times. Did you? see his potential at, at uh, that early age? Well, I never thought he'd be president, but I thought he was certainly going to be, a, you know, a very important guy. And it, you know, he went back and became governor very soon, and I thought maybe he was going to go to the Senate, but he certainly, then he became president of the United States. You know, so he said, no, he, he's very, no, I see him, in fact, uh, when was it, Vern Jordan had a party the night before the inauguration, and he was there, and I, it fortunately took my youngest boy and his wife and their two children, so they all met Bill Clinton, and they thought that was the high point of leaving. Brock didn't show up, so he was going to meet him. Um, what made you decide to accept the position as Transportation Secretary under Gerald Ford? Well, I actually, if you really want to know the truth, uh, he called me down and he offered me three other positions before that one. One was to be ambassador to the UN, I said no to. Uh, another one was to be deputy secretary of commerce because he said in a month from now he's going to get rid of the guy and I'd be I'd become the secretary. And then, and I said no to that, and I forget what the third one was. Uh, and then he said, what about transportation? I didn't know anything about that, so you never can say, I don't know what you're talking about. So I'd say, gee, I have to think about that. You know, and so when I went home, fortunately, my daughter was down from the Yale Law School and said, you got to do it, because that time so few minorities had been in the cabinet. And so then I called the president and said, if you still want me, you got your man. So he then gave me the job. But he told me that if we'd won the election, I'd been the attorney general. But we lost the election. What, were, uh, what would you say was your greatest accomplishment? as Secretary of Transportation? No, my only great comrade, I, I married my wife, other than that. <laughs> no, seriously. No, what, no, I thought well, we did a lot. Well, one was to get the Penn Central out of bankruptcy and get it done, although I think I made a mistake by letting them create Conrail, but I got in so late I couldn't change it around. I think greatly, secondly, the challenge of, uh, of uh, removing all the environmental objections and getting the highway system complete. <clears throat> Next was uh, when I took office, uh, the metro here was only 10 miles, and the only federal commitment was that uh, Nixon had said, we will, we will uh, lend you a billion dollars. Of course, it costs much more than that. But fortunately, you had a great mayor then, Mayor Washington, and we got together and we decided that the money which was allocated 
for building highways through Washington could be used for this. So that gave them money. And then we got more, Ford gave them more money. Now you got a system of 122 miles, and you're going to extend it to Dallas and beyond. So I thought that was great. And then the Concord matter, I thought, was very important. And another matter, I was in the cabinet, really had nothing to do with it, when they had two issues. One was whether the federal government was going to give money to New York to save it from bankruptcy. And the other issue was whether the Solicitor General was going to come in on the side of the white parents to claim that busing of kids in Boston was illegal. And we had this cabinet meeting and the Attorney General was making both presentations. And the first one he made it and said, well, I really think you should just let a, you know, Federal judge do that, make it, let it go bankrupt and everything. And they got on this one. And so when he got finished, I said, you know, this is amazing that you're going to take a federal judge and have him run the whole city of New York, which is one thing politicians do. But then when you get around to uh, whether you can bust the desegregated schools in Boston, you are, uh, you are saying that the only part of the government that has really functioned properly in ending this, that you, you shouldn't do that. We should go in to tell them that they can't do it. And President Ford at that moment said, well, you know, Bill, I never liked busing. When I played football, I still would walk to school even though I was injured. And I said, well, Mr. President, if you will get on this television and give that the reason why you would permit or be against busing, I'll support you. So that dropped that, so the government did not come in the case, so they busted Boston. I thought those things were. And then some other economic matters, you know, in, international matters, which I thought we'd straighten out fairly well. But the, my failure was I didn't make high-speed trains, and I should have done that, and several other things. And I, and I tried, like heck, to make the, the Washington River thing better, but I didn't do it, but Liz Dole did it, and she came out and did it. PepsiCo. Was ex had the exclusive right to sell PepsiCo in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Kendall comes to me and said, you know, we're having trouble because Coke has come in, because this is the year of the Olympics, mm -hmm. and they've already gotten the right to sell in the stadium. They're going to now get the right to sell those place and get us kicked out. I have a two-hour meeting with Brezhnev. You have to come with me. So I go to the Soviet Union, go to this meeting, Don Kendall, myself, Brezhnev and his special assistant. What did I talk about the first hour and a half? I don't know. Talk about that guy in the middle. It's that guy in the middle. You know who that is? Oh, Tassel? No, no the middle. middle. That's Alexander Pushkin. Oh, yes. The great Russian. Yes. Most American kids don't realize he was black. Oh, uh, yes. But really, I mean, I get a hundred people a year coming from prison and nobody else. But more important than that, the grandfather, who was the first black girl, married a white Russian girl. Peter the Great liked him so well, he made him a Russian nobleman. And he also made him a major general in the Russian army, sent him to Europe for five years to learn how to use artillery fire. He comes back and he's the leading commander of the Russians at the Battle of Petrova, 1707 the first time the Russians ever defeated a European power. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that, and the president knew, and, uh, and we talked about other things, because they got museums all over, Pushkin museums, either the grandfather of this guy. And then finally Pushkin said, pardon me, I got to go to the men's room, for, I'll be, but I'll be back in five minutes. He leaves, his specialist says, you know, Mr. Coleman, you've been here an hour and a half, you still haven't told us what you want. But I assure you, whatever you want, he'll give you. And so that's how PepsiCo now is still the leading person. Wow. wow. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with Alison Blakely's work on blacks in Europe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew about the, with the Queen of Sheba long before I knew about Elizabeth I. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, really. But that, but it's a real tragedy when you take, there's a guy, he's, he's got a daughter here at one time was in the council, who's a doctor who really discovered blood plasma. And 20% of the troops that were, sa were shot got saved by that. Charles but nobody Stern. ever gives him credit. Yes. And yes. and George Washington Car Carver saved the South for about 20 years ago. But those things are not mentioned, you know, and I really, great tragedy. Mm -hmm. 
challenges that you may have faced over the years uh, being uh, a, a black Republican and whether that has um, informed uh, perhaps uh, your perspective on things or has changed your perspective on things? No, no, really. I, I, I just, I think it's a tragedy that uh, that people of color, most of them are in the Democratic Party now. Now, I'm not saying that a year when Barack Obama is winning and running that that shouldn't have happened, but I think if you're in both parties, you can have more power than you otherwise. I mean, I, I probably get more of the Democrats, you know, Kennedy, you know, they give me more than Republicans, but it's nice to be in both parties. But I just think they should be people in both parties. You, and of course, you may vote differently from the way you you you, you pro, but I just think it's very important. Mm -hmm. Like I have to, you know, I got a client, a hedge fund guy, and I know I got to get them not to regulate hedge fund, and I could just think of the Republican senators I can get to help me to kind of hold off those Democrats. Yeah. I, I, the last question has to do with um, uh, a quote from Charles Ogletree, who, who described you as someone who really is an amazing legend. And throughout your life, you've been among the first, or the first. And I was wondering how you felt about being described as a legend, and looking back on your life, how you felt about being the first. Well, I'm not a legend, and, I, and I'm, no, I've always, in almost anything I've had, I've seen people of color much brighter than I am. You know? And I really think it's an opportunity to give them, and if we could do that, uh, that's, that's good. You know? Like, I, you know, I very much, you know, when I started practicing law, I worked most Saturdays and Sundays. And Saturday, we have all lawyers in here, but they don't come. They don't do that. I'd love to be able to develop something where you get one or two kids in these high school, junior high school, bring them here Saturday morning, start teaching, them, then go off and do your work, and then three o'clock, you know, come back and ask them, and take them out and buy them. I really, because it's really, you know. Passing on from general, you know, Lincoln got it passed on by somebody before. And it's amazing the extent to which people accept, you know, I mean, if, if you, I know Bill Clinton's parents were so terrible that a girl that liked him very much, they went down and she said, I'd never marry that family, they, they're terrible, you know. And, and I just think that if you really expose to the people that I know of color, that, you know, there'd be no problem. And, and uh, that's what you got to do it. If you're on a board of a bank, you know, you can, you can get that done. And, and I think more and more, and I, I just don't want us to say, well, you, you look upon us, I got to take care of that group. Uh, you know, now with Eric going to be Attorney General, with Colin Powell having been Secretary of State with the Rice Girl, you, nobody can say there's no talent that people can't do. And I think that's what you got to do. And I think all our schools got to do it. And really, people that's that's the most important thing. What would you like to be most remembered by? Just, just a fair, nice, decent guy that uh, didn't screw up too much. I'm serious. I mean, I, you know, I know, you know, Bill Hasty was superb. Charlie Houston was superb. But I've just known some very able guy. And you take the guy who's president of American Express. You watch him talk about issues. He's as good as anybody else. Uh, uh, and certainly Condoleezza Rice was a very able person, and Colin Powell, who was right up the street from me, was very, very able. And I, I just, you know, really, that's what you got to communicate to your kids. And, you know, I mean, when I was a young kid, I was convinced that blacks couldn't play baseball. Because when I would go to the game, they'd be now. But since they opened it up, half the teams are black and Spanish now. And I just, I, I, I know no instance where you oper give an opportunity where they haven't, some of them excel very well. And I think that's what's important. That's what you got to tell, the, tell the, the, the next generation. Thank you so much.